Hey everyone, Phil here and welcome back to the channel. Now, take two. Can you figure out what is wrong with this picture now, right now, this very second? Let me know in the comment section below. And now let's just dive into the story and don't forget to give the video a like so it can be shared with other people. Let's go. The Elizabethan era, named for Queen Elizabeth Byrne, who reigned from 1558 to 1603, was a time of immense cultural growth, national pride, and global exploration for England. As Spain and Portugal claimed territories in the New World, a sense of urgency bubbled within the English court to establish their foothold in these uncharted lands. Sir Walter Raleigh, a well-known adventurer, courtier, and close favorite of the Queen, recognized the potential of the Americas. After being knighted in 1585, he acquired a charter from Queen Elizabeth, granting him the rights to discover, search, find out, and view such remote heathen and barbarous lands, countries, and territories, to have, hold, occupy, and enjoy. The promising shores of North America drew his attention, specifically a patch of land off the coast of present-day North Carolina, known as Roanoke Island. The island offered strategic advantages. It was well shielded from the open sea potentially protecting settlers from the prying eyes and cannons of the Spanish Armada. It also promised rich soils and bountiful waters, critical components for a successful colony. With visions of prosperity and a burning desire to outpace England's European rivals, the stage was set for what would become one of history's most enigmatic ventures, the establishment and subsequent disappearance of the Roanoke colony. Before the ill-fated 1587 settlement, Roanoke Island had already beckoned English explorers eager to chart its secrets. Sir Walter Raleigh, fueled by ambition and royal favor, first dispatched an exploratory mission in 1584. Led by Philip Amatus and Arthur Barlow, this team's primary objective was reconnaissance, to map the area, assess its resources, and initiate relations with the local inhabitants. Amadis and Barlow returned to England with glowing accounts of Roanoke, describing an Eden-like land rich with lush forests, diverse wildlife, and amicable native tribes. Their tales captured the English imagination, prompting Raleigh to move swiftly. They also brought back two indigenous people, Manteo and Wanchese, who provided valuable insights into their homeland and culture. This exchange was perceived as an auspicious start to English native relations. Bolstered by these findings, in 1585, Raleigh organized a larger expedition to establish a more permanent English presence on Roanoke. Sir Richard Grenville led this group, aiming to lay the groundwork for a long-lasting colony. The settlers, mostly military men and adventurers, were soon met with the harsh realities of colonial life. Upon arrival, they worked to fortify the island, building a small fortress and other structures. However, the challenges were plenty. Food became scarce as the settlers, inexperienced in the agrarian practices suitable for the New World, struggled with cultivation. Additionally, what began as a promising relationship with the native Algonquian tribes soon soured. Misunderstandings, coupled with the English tendency to assert dominance, led to a dramatic escalation in tensions. An incident where a silver cup was stolen from the English resulted in Grenville's decision to burn an entire village, severely straining the settlers' relationship with the natives. These mounting challenges, exacerbated by the looming threat of Spanish discovery and intervention, made it clear that survival on Roanoke would be no simple task. With supplies dwindling rapidly and morale at an adir, the decision was made. The settlers would abandon the colony and return to England. They left behind a fortified island, but more importantly, a series of lessons about the unpredictability and intricacies of the New World. While the previous expeditions to Roanoke yielded valuable insights, they were marked by hardships and hasty departures. However, in 1587, a new wave of optimism emerged as Raleigh prepared a fresh expedition. This time, the mission was different. It was not merely about scouting or establishing a military foothold. The aim was to cultivate a thriving English community in the New World. John White, an artist and cartographer who had accompanied the 1585 expedition, was chosen to lead this new group. 
His previous experience on the island, combined with his leadership qualities, made him an apt choice. Under his guidance, a group of 115 settlers set sail, comprised of families, artisans, farmers, and tradespeople. Their diverse skill set was indicative of the expedition's goals, to forge a lasting community, both self-sustaining and beneficial to England. Upon their arrival, the settlers discovered the remnants of the 1585 colony, the fortress and some desolate buildings, a silent testament to the challenges faced by their predecessors. Undeterred, they began the task of rebuilding, repairing structures, and laying the foundation for their new homes. The inclusion of women and children in this expedition was a significant change from the previous groups. This indicated a long-term vision for the colony. Among them was Eleanor Dare, White's daughter, who would later give birth to Virginia Dare, the first English child born in the New World. However, as the days turned to weeks, the settlers realized the enormity of their undertaking. The island's resources, though abundant, required expertise to harness. Additionally, while the settlers brought diverse skills from England, the New World presented unique challenges, requiring adaptation and ingenuity. The memories of strained relations with the indigenous tribes loomed large, casting a shadow of uncertainty over their interactions. White, understanding the complexities of their situation, knew that the success of this colony rested not only on their ability to build and cultivate, but also on forging alliances and navigating the delicate dynamics of this new land. Roanoke Island, like much of the Americas, was not an untouched paradise awaiting English settlers. It was a land rich in culture, history, and people, notably the Algonquian-speaking tribes that had called it home for generations. The Sakotan, Croatoan, and other tribes populated the surrounding regions, each with its own customs, politics, and relationship to the land. John White and his settlers understood that their survival was intrinsically linked to their ability to foster relationships with these native inhabitants. Initial exchanges seemed promising. Manteo, one of the indigenous individuals who had traveled to England after the 1584 expedition, returned with the 1587 settlers and acted as a liaison between the English and the natives. His unique position of understanding both cultures was invaluable, aiding in communication and offering insights into tribal customs and politics. However, the shadow of previous expeditions loomed large. Sir Richard Grenville's decision to burn an Algonquian village in retaliation for a stolen cup during the 1585 expedition had left deep scars. The indigenous tribes had memories of these violent acts, making them understandably wary of the newcomers. Despite these challenges, there were moments of collaboration and camaraderie. The settlers were eager to learn from the Algonquian tribes, gleaning knowledge on local agriculture, hunting, and fishing. In exchange, the English introduced some of their own tools and techniques. Yet the balance was fragile. Minor misunderstandings had the potential to escalate rapidly. An incident where some English settlers, suspecting the nearby tribes of plotting against them, preemptively attacked and killed some native inhabitants further strained relations. The complexities of tribal politics also played a role. Not every tribe had the same disposition towards the settlers. While some were curious or friendly, others were skeptical or outright hostile. Manteo was eventually baptized into the Church of England and was named the Lord of Roanoke and Dasamunkapuk. This symbolic gesture was meant to bridge the two worlds, but in reality, the cultural chasm was profound and often misread by both sides. As days turned into months, the settlers found themselves walking a tightrope. The success of the Roanoke colony hinged not only on their ability to cultivate the land, but also on navigating the intricate maze of intercultural relations. This delicate dance would shape the course of their stay in the New World and contribute to the enduring mystery of their eventual fate. The hopeful spirit that initially filled the settlers of the 1587 expedition was gradually tempered by the myriad challenges they faced. While the settlers worked tirelessly to establish their community, certain realities became glaringly apparent. The supplies they had brought with them from England were quickly depleting, and the promise of self-sustainability on the island seemed distant. Their relations with the indigenous tribes, 
though marked by moments of collaboration, remained tenuous at best. Moreover, the threat from outside forces was ever-present. Spain, a mighty European power with colonies and interests in the Americas, was a constant concern. The English settlers, aware of the vast and well-equipped Spanish Armada, understood that they were vulnerable to potential attacks. Faced with these mounting challenges, the colony's leadership convened. It was decided that a trip back to England was necessary to secure additional supplies, reinforcements, and possibly more settlers. John White, given his familiarity with both the aspirations of the colony and the resources in England, was chosen for this critical mission. It was a decision met with mixed emotions. White was deeply invested in the colony's success, not just as its leader, but also as a grandfather. His daughter, Eleanor Dare, had given birth to Virginia Dare, the first English child born in the New World. The thought of leaving his family and the community he was entrusted to lead was agonizing. Before his departure, White made arrangements to ensure the colony's safety in his absence. A plan was devised. Should the settlers decide to move, they would carve their destination onto a tree or post. If the move was made under duress, they would include a Maltese cross as a sign of distress. With a heavy heart, White boarded the ship, promising a swift return with the necessary aid. As the shores of Roanoke faded into the horizon, little did he know that this farewell would mark the beginning of one of history's most enduring mysteries. As John White's ship sailed towards England, he was buoyed by a singular focus, to procure supplies and support for the fledgling colony he'd left behind. However, upon reaching English shores, White encountered a situation far more tumultuous than he had anticipated. The geopolitical climate of Europe was charged. The ongoing Anglo-Spanish War had reached a fever pitch. England's conflict with Spain was not just a territorial dispute, but also bore the weight of religious tensions as Protestant England squared off against Catholic Spain. The powerful Spanish Armada was preparing to launch a significant offensive against England, aiming to dethrone Queen Elizabeth the Prince and reassert Catholic rule. Given the dire circumstances, all available English ships were commandeered for the war effort, including those that might have been used to ferry supplies back to Roanoke. White found himself ensnared in bureaucratic and logistical challenges. Every attempt to secure a ship for his return journey was thwarted, either by naval priorities or by privateers more interested in raiding than in resupplying a distant colony. Months turned into years. The delay was agonizing for White, who was anxious about the well-being of his family and the other settlers. Letters and records from the period reflect his growing desperation and the barriers he faced. Funding the expedition was another challenge. The costly war drained England's coffers, and private investment was hard to come by, given the risks associated with transatlantic voyages during wartime. It wasn't until 1590, three long years after his departure, that White finally managed to secure passage on a ship headed to the New World. The voyage was primarily a privateering mission, with the resupply of Roanoke as a secondary objective. As the ship approached Roanoke Island, White was consumed by a mix of hope and anxiety. What had become of the settlers? Had they managed to thrive in his absence, or had they faced insurmountable challenges? These questions would soon find their haunting answers. The shores of Roanoke Island, once buzzing with the hopes and activities of the English settlers, now appeared eerily quiet as John White and his party disembarked. The weight of anticipation was palpable among the crew, but nothing could prepare them for the scene that awaited. The initial signs were puzzling. The settlement seemed orderly, with no indications of a hasty evacuation or violent confrontation. However, the structures, once filled with the daily routines and laughter of the settlers, stood abandoned. The fortifications appeared somewhat dismantled, suggesting a possible relocation rather than a sudden attack. The most intriguing clue was found on a wooden post. The word Croatoan was carved into it. Recalling the arrangement made before his departure, White searched for the Maltese cross that would indicate distress, but it was conspicuously absent. This suggested that the settlers had moved voluntarily to Croatoan, an island to the south, known today as Hatteras Island, where they hoped to find a friendlier relationship with the indigenous tribe residing there. While White was desperate to head to Croatoan immediately 
and search for the settlers, Mother Nature had other plans. The weather turned treacherous, with fierce winds and raging seas making any further voyage dangerous. Additionally, the crew, having already achieved their primary privateering objectives, was eager to return to England, fearing the onset of the hurricane season. The situation was agonizing for White. The clues left behind raised more questions than answers. Had the settlers integrated with the Croatoan tribe? Were they still waiting for the promised supplies? Or had some tragedy befallen them after they left their initial settlement? Reluctantly, White agreed to return to England, with the mysteries of Roanoke remaining unsolved. He carried with him the weight of unanswered questions and the haunting possibility that he might never know the fate of his family and fellow settlers. The island, with its empty buildings and enigmatic carvings, stood as a silent testament to the lost colony and the myriad speculations that would arise in the centuries to come. The disappearance of the Roanoke settlers left a void, not just on the shores of the island, but in the annals of history. Over the subsequent centuries, the tale of the lost colony transitioned from being a pressing mystery to a haunting legend, captivating historians, archaeologists, and enthusiasts alike. Various theories arose in an attempt to decode the settlers' fate, integration with native tribes. Some believed that the settlers, facing hardships, might have joined local tribes for survival. There are tales of blue-eyed, English-speaking Native Americans in later years bolstering this theory. Genetic studies and archaeological excavations have tried to identify traces of the settlers among the descendants of local tribes. Spanish attack. The threat of the Spanish, always looming in the background, gave rise to speculation that a Spanish raiding party from Florida might have attacked and captured or killed the colonists. Relocation and failed resettlement. The settlers might have attempted to resettle elsewhere, possibly further inland. However, without adequate supplies and facing unfamiliar terrains, they could have perished. Natural calamities. Some theories suggest that diseases, drought, or other natural calamities might have decimated the colony. Internal conflict. A lack of supplies and the inherent stress of building a new community in an unknown land might have led to infighting and eventual dispersal. Modern technology has breathed new life into this age-old mystery. Archaeologists, using advanced ground-penetrating radar and satellite imagery, have identified sites of interest in both Roanoke and nearby regions like Hatteras Island. Excavations have unearthed English-style pottery and artifacts alongside indigenous ones, hinting at possible interactions or integrations. However, the story of Roanoke is not just about the mystery of its settlers' disappearance. It stands as a testament to the challenges of colonization, the perils of venturing into the unknown, and the profound impact of cultural interactions. The tale of the lost colony serves as a poignant reminder of the indomitable human spirit, the quest for new horizons, and the unpredictable nature of history itself. As investigations continue and new clues emerge, Roanoke retains its enigmatic allure, beckoning those who seek answers to look closer, dig deeper, and imagine the myriad possibilities. Thank you for watching everyone. Let me know in the comments section if you have heard of this story before. And now I will say goodnight. Don't forget to hit the like button and I will see you in the next video. Peace.